here for the fifth installment of our Global Queer series. This is the fifth and final uh, installment of this uh, spring series that we've run through the Car Center. And our guest today is Michael Longo, who is uh, an adjunct professor at NYU, uh, New York University, who teaches travel writing and uh, is a freelance journalist, editor, and photographer. Uh, Mike's work has appeared in the New York Times and Bloomberg News, National Geographic Traveler, Out Traveler, and many other publications. He's the author, editor, and co-editor of several travel books, including Frommer's Buenos Aires, uh, America's best-selling guide to the Argentine capital, uh, Gay Tourism, Culture, Identity, and Sex, which he co-edited with Dr. Stephen Clift and Carrie Callister, and The Route Which Gay Travels in the Muslim World, the only gay-themed uh, American book ever published in Arabic. He also wrote a novel, The Voyeur, which was, pub Voyeur, which was published by Allison Books in 2007. Uh, Professor, Professor Longo has traveled to more than 80 countries and all seven continents with a geographic concentration in Latin America and the Middle East. He has written extensively in culture, tourism, and human rights in the context of war, with a particular focus on Iraq and Afghanistan, which will be the topic of, uh, question the topic of his uh, talk and discussion tonight. His work has received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association, and the Society of American Travel Writers and other groups, and uh, we are really excited to have, to have you here uh, with us today. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ian Likas, who will moderate tonight's discussion. Ian. Great. Well, thank you, Tim, for that introduction, and thank you to everyone who has come here tonight. I've been looking forward to this, uh, this final event in our five-part series on global queer rights. Now, some of you have been here through the series as we move through Palestine, through the Balkans, uh, through Mexico, last week Uganda, and now to Iraq and the Middle East, back to the Middle East. Uh, and in advance of next weekend's, uh, this coming weekend's uh, Gay Rights and Human Rights Conference here at the Kennedy School. Tim will mention a little more about that later on. I've been looking forward to this. You know, I've been following you know, Mike's work and more generally the coverage of LGBT rights in post-invasion Iraq you know, since the outbreak of the war. It's hard to believe, I think, that you know, now here in spring 2011, that we're approaching, we're actually past the eighth anniversary of the war, a war that has by and large dropped from the radar screen of Americans. And even, you know, the, even the Afghan war, getting a little more attention has also dropped, I think, in the age of global recession, our gaze has turned inwards. But I've been following this coverage, you know, with, you know, stories of, you know, the coming out from Doug Ireland's work, uh, some of you may have seen David Frank's work in GQ, a number of accounts, a, a incredibly in-depth and devastating report from Human Rights Watch about anti-LGBT violence in or post invasion Iraq. And this is a story that by and large doesn't get much coverage in mainstream news, a little bit here and there, an article in the Times. But you know, as Mike will talk about, you know, there has been a pretty horrific you know, series of you know, the pattern of killings and extrajudicial violence in Iraq and of torture, but there's also more going on beneath the surface, and as Iraq slips, unfortunately, from the media gaze, mainstream media gaze in this country, you know, I very much am looking forward to hearing from Mike and help us think through what the, you know, the nuances of a story that gets told in very black and white terms in this country. So with that, I'm going to just invite Mike to start telling us about you know, his travels through um, gay Baghdad and more generally the region to introduce us to the topic. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. Um, I'm not wired. I don't know if people can oh. actually hear me. But, oh, so, um, I have any other links? Still is very abstract. Even if you read the papers every day, 
even if you follow a lot of coverage, um, the spaces and what places are like, what the city is like, is something that most Americans are completely unfamiliar with. And then to take that one step extra, and where it was possible, where it was possible to photograph gay spaces, and you'd be surprised actually by the amount of stuff that exists in a city like Baghdad. One of the things that I emphasize to people is my research showed it was a tale of two cities. Um, we talked a little bit about Doug Ireland's coverage. We talked a little bit about David Francis' coverage. Um, these are all fantastic pieces, and my work follows on them. But what's different is that I was actually able to go visit the spaces. It wasn't just that I listened to people on the phone, that I only listened to people who had left Iraq, but to actually go and visit the spaces and see the contrast that existed within Baghdad. For some gay men, there were no problems at all. For many gay men, it was a completely horrific story. The other thing, the point that I want to make is that the gay story is one small part of a much larger story. Um, you have millions of people who have been displaced since the war. You have estimates up to, I mean, 100,000 people who have been killed since the U.S. invasion. Um, the numbers differ. It's very horrific for women. It's very horrific for Christians. It's very horrific for these, these fights between Shias and between Sunnis. So the gay part is one small part of a very violent, um, violent thing that has been released in Baghdad and other parts of Iraq since the invasion. So the first space that I really want to take you through is Abu Nawaz Street, which is along the Tigris. Now Abu Nawaz Street was named for um, a, 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 an erotic bisexual poet. Um, this area is along the Tigris River, the main river that goes through Baghdad. The first time that I went to Baghdad in 2007, it was completely impossible to see this area. It was far too dangerous in 2007. I've, just to clarify, I've been to Iraq twice, 2007 and again in 2009. In 2009, where the, my latest piece from, from Gay City News took place, took a very long time to write that up because it also included material from refugees in, in other parts of the Middle East and other countries. Um, it was much safer to move around. The safety meant that nightlife had returned. And with nightlife returning, gay nightlife, and therefore more of an ability to target gay men. Um, so safety had this very violent aspect to it. Safety in quotes. Um, you got cruising along Abu Nawaz. Um, it was always famous for that. It was always famous also for its prostitution. Um, it's an area that was sort of carnival-esque. Um, it's an area that's sort of a boardwalk, so you have a lot of games, you have a lot of people out with their families. Um, this is under normal conditions, and a lot of the big hotels also lined Abu Nawaz. It is also directly across the river from the Green Zone, which also was what created a lot of danger early on, because a lot of the missiles that were meant for the U.S. Embassy and other, other buildings wound up falling along Abu Nawaz. So what we have here is a statue of Abu Nawaz himself. Uh, we have a view of late night cruising near the hotels. And we have a view of the back of a group of men who offered to take me around um, to see gay sites within Baghdad. Now, another uh, area that figures very much within the work was Al-Kindi Hospital. Al-Kindi Hospital is a no questions asked hospital. So many of the gay men who were attacked, I think we, people had heard of the, um, uh, the silicone or the glue that was, that was injected into men's anuses and, uh, as part of the torture. For some men who survived this, uh, they would go to Al-Kindi Hospital and no questions were asked as to why this had happened to them. The other part of this though, because it is a no questions asked hospital, is that the insurgents also controlled parts of the hospital. So while it was a refuge, and, and again, this is another aspect, there is almost no place to hide. Even a, a place that is safe is not a place that is safe. It only has limited safety. Uh, this is also an area where bodies were dumped uh, near the hospital. So again, it's an area that should be a safe zone, is to a degree, and yet is not and is also where people who were killed wind up show, showing up dumped. 
Sure. Is it right to interact with questions? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. What does it mean for parts of the hospital to be controlled by its parents? What happens, and we've seen this now recently, for example, in, in Egypt, uh, with the uh, uh, where, where people who were beaten in Tahrir Square were brought to the hospital and then their families <coughs> disappeared. Uh, this is before Mubarak had, had, had resigned. The, if you went to the hospital, and if, clearly, if you went to the hospital because you had silicone glue put up your anus, it was very clear why that had happened. So what would happen is the insurgents who controlled the hospital, so some of the militias, would find out why are people in the hospital, what doctors are taking care of them, who are the family members that are coming to find them. And this was the danger of coming to the hospital. So within that hospital, there were certain gay sympathetic doctors, certain, as I understood it, gay doctors themselves. I was not able to actually visit the interior of the hospital, only the outskirts of the hospital, and drive around before we became too noticed um, driving around the hospital. Um, the Kerala district is a district actually where my hotel was. Um, I stayed in, uh, why am I blanking on the name of uh, the Alhambra Hotel, uh, which ultimately, in the article, I never mentioned the name of the hotel to protect it, um, but that hotel was eventually bombed anyway. It's just unfortunately part of Baghdad. Um, the Karaba district was, is described alternatively as an international area. It's where a lot of the media companies are. Um, so for instance, in my hotel were many international um, publications. It's a rather well-to-do area. It's close to the University of Baghdad. Um, the gentleman who took me around, and you see the back of him here looking out onto one of Saddam's palaces, palace complexes, he described it as a, he didn't use the word metrosexual, but where it's sort of liberal, it's sort of fashionable, you can't really tell if it's gay or not. So he felt that this area was very safe. Yet, if you were discovered as gay, nothing is safe in the long run. Um, I also show a photograph of the Shisha Cafe, only the outside of it. Ordinarily, in an article, I would never mention this cafe. However, USA Today and New York Magazine had both mentioned the name of this, this cafe. So we felt with Gay City News that it was fine to actually mention the name of this, this cafe. I was unable to photograph inside of the cafe. Again, the men who took me around took quite, quite a bit of risks themselves. Um, I'm of Mediterranean Italian background. I pass as Arab Christian. I pass as Lebanese. Um, I, on the surface, if I don't open my mouth, I could blend in, and that's why they need to take me. I couldn't photograph. I couldn't speak English loudly, but the cafe was loud enough that we could have a conversation. Um, so that's the Karada district. So again, we're already seeing two different cities. Mutanabi Street is a bookseller street. Um, what surprised me was that my own book, the Arabic version of it, was for sale, which surprised me. But you have a lot of gayish books, you have liberal books, you have sexual books for sale on Mutanabi Street. So again, it's another example of a tale of two cities. Anti-gay media and gay death lists. And I think that some people here have already heard of the, the gay death lists that were put out. Um, we blurred the image on the website, so this is one of the images. Uh, and these were put on poles around Sadr City. Sadr City is the area that Muqtada al-Sadr controlled. Um, it was the heart of the insurgency and one of the most dangerous, one of the most religiously conservative, one of the poorest districts within Baghdad. Um, there's also a newspaper, I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's a religious newspaper. And here you have an image of someone transgendered. So they would publish pictures of people um, in their articles. Um, the other thing that I want to throw in with this, and we did this in the article, is that homophobia also exists within the US military. So we have this anti-gay graffiti that exists on, a, on a, one of the Baghdad military bases where they wrote FAG over FAC. Defact meaning dining facility. So, and then they tried to actually erase it. So the homophobia exists, unfortunately, in Baghdad on many different levels. Um, so it, the U.S. wasn't necessarily a safe zone for some of the people um, to escape to. These are just images of Sadr City. Um, again, you see Muqtada al-Sadr, you see other religious leaders, you see his father. It's actually technically 
named for his, his father. Um, other names for this city are Thawa City, um, or Revolution City. It was created as a, uh, after the revolution that got rid of the Cayman in 1952. Baghdad expanded uh, tremendously, and this area of the city um, grew, and largely it was people from rural areas who tended to be more religious, who tended to be not as sophisticated as those who already lived in Baghdad. And this is the power center of Muqtada al-Sadr. It was from here that the insurgency uh, and the, the attacks on gay men were launched. Uh, this is inside of a safe house run by Iraqi LGBT. Iraqi LGBT is a group actually based out of London. Um, and this is one of their safe houses. This safe house has actually since been closed. Um, and this is in a, a, a better neighborhood, actually, within, within Baghdad. Um, and so two of the men were actually, and again, we had a debate about use of terminology in the article, transgendered. Um, many of the, those who were transgendered actually used this word she-male um, to describe themselves, which isn't a word that we would necessarily use. Um, when we decided to go ahead with using that word in the article while explaining that word. Um, men would describe themselves as men who were female. So the, the, the notion of being transgendered was also somewhat fluid. Um, it surprised me, actually, that, that you could actually get the hormones in Baghdad, um, but there was no problem getting hormones. The problem for uh, the men in, uh, <coughs> in white, in particular, was that in the summer, it was very hard to go out into the street. Um, and only in the winter could they go out because then under a lot of clothing, they would be able to hide that they had been trans they had become transgender. The final thing that I want to leave you with is this notion of allies, but allies in quotes. Um, one of the people that I interviewed was Maysoon al Damluji. She's from Alawi's party. Um, Alawi is a very, it's a very liberal party, blanking on the name of the actual coalition. Um, she agreed to an interview with me while stating that she was uncomfortable with talking about homosexuality, but needed to actually present another face of, of Iraq. I think the quote that she gave me was that, you know, we're not all axe murderers chasing after homosexuals. Um, another group that, had, that has actually done a lot more work than I think is acknowledged is the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, and that's Yanar Mohammed um, is the woman who runs it. And she was a fantastic resource. I had actually done um, the, the, the hands that you see are one of the interviews that I did there. Um, she was actually probably sheltering and helping more gay men than is probably acknowledged. Um, it's my belief, after having been there, that women's groups are probably a good ally um, for looking at gay rights issues. The majority of people that I spoke with, including um, Western government officials who can't be named, um, is that you have to lump gay rights in with human rights as a whole and cannot separate gay rights. Um, and most, most politicians, most locals, even if they're liberal, were not in favor of equal rights for gays. They didn't want gay people killed, but they didn't think that um, gay people should be, should be given special rights is, is probably the way that they put it. So any acknowledgment of the killings had to be done in a very subtle way, even at the government level. Um, and it's this problem that Iraq has that makes it very hard for people in the West to understand that you can't just go there and say, well, look, you know, people are killing gay men, um, and you have to stop this because of people's rights and because of all of this. It's just not approached in that way in Iraq. So these are just some slides that I wanted to kind of show and um, you know have as kind of a background um, for what we're talking about to kind of make, to give a little bit more of a, a physical context to some of the things that we're talking about. Okay? Oh, terrific. And there's all sorts of questions. There goes my mic. But I'm still mic clearly, right? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Uh, <clears throat> Thinking, you know, I, I had actually, as I was rereading your series of articles in preparation for this, you know, I was actually struck by the very quote that you read from a, a parliamentarian, uh, Al Damjou, yeah. about uh, you know, from the you know, from the Secular Nationalist Party of Karakia. Uh, I don't feel comfortable, but I, but the reason I do 
talk about it not feeling comfortable is that one has to give another image of Iraqi. It's not everyone is a madman with an axe trying to kill a homosexual. Gay rights, she said, have created a stigma regarding all human rights work in Iraq. Every time we speak about human rights, we're accused of supporting homosexuality. She said, it is, has to be separated, otherwise we lose all human rights. <laughs> and you know, this sort of question about how do, you know, how does human rights become a, um, a cover is an awkward word, but it becomes you know, an umbrella under which LGBT rights can be folded. And, you know, it speaks to one of your introductory remarks that this is a small part of a broader story um, in terms of violence you know, between Shia and Sunni, between you know, violence against Christians, violence against women. Can you, talk, you know, tell me more, uh, tell us more about how this question about the relationship specifically between LGBT rights and the broader human rights agenda was something that other Iraqis that you encountered talked about? Well, you know, what was very interesting is uh, there was a gentleman who gave me a huge amount of help um, he was liberal. Um, he came to the hotel to give me a lot of background. He had warned me uh, about a lot of things. He had gay friends. He worked in the cultural field. Um, and actually, I quote him on this. He, he, in the piece, is that you know something to the effect of, you know, let me make myself very clear. I'm very anti-gay, um, but I don't think that people should be killed for being gay. Um, while at the same time admitting that he had gay friends, while at the same time admitting um, that working in the cultural sphere, he, he knew quite a few gay people. Um, the way in which it needed to be brought up, I mean, with me soon, I was very open about what, what um, I was covering. With many other people, I kind of would use it, talk about other things, and then, then go into the subject of the gay killings. With some of the Western government officials that I spoke with, they would bring up many different things and then fold the gay stuff into it. One of the things that they talked about um, was, okay, even if you and Iraq do not think that this is an important thing, the West, looking at you, believes that this is an important thing. And we know that that doesn't always work. Um, an example that I give in terms of women's rights issues is when you talk about women's rights in some countries, they don't think about Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. They think of Britney Spears showing her cooch on television. And that, to many people in, in some countries, is that's what women's rights means, a woman doing obscene things. It doesn't mean Hillary Clinton giving a speech um, as, part, as a government official. Um, so, when people think that extremely about granting equal rights or granting human rights uh, to individual groups, you have to be far more subtle in how you bring it about. Um, I think that bringing it as part of an umbrella of many different things is often the way to do it. Um, and I think pairing with women's rights groups, as much as even they soon have commented that this can damage other discussions of human rights, you need to do it as not just gay rights, but the broader context. But the other thing that some of the Western officials talked about was even if you don't care that gay people should have equal rights, the killing should still be stopped. And so it was really more about the violence, more about um, finding ways to end violence overall, gay people being a part of that, not even talking about whether <coughs> gay people should be treated equally. Does that kind of answer the question? It's it's very broad and with many different components to it. And this is something that sort of has come up in a number of our different events mm -hmm. in this series. In you know, in, you know, just last week talking about Uganda, the way that you know what you know the Western media portrays that is the Western media attention that is holding it is holding the uh, kill quote unquote kill kill the gays bill from being passed in the Uganda Parliament. And our speaker last week, Val Kalende, talked about you know, sort of the importance of actually looking at uh, Ugandan grassroots organizing. Now it doesn't seem like there's the, the, to the extent that there is grassroots Iraqi organizing, it's happening among refugees, among externally displaced people in London particularly, yeah. rather than actually an organized political movement happening. But there is this question about how 
human rights and the West get conflated in where the inter particularly for LGBT rights mm -hmm. and so the kind of resentment and this is the mirror side in many ways of the critique that's come from a number of scholars and most notably perhaps you know Joseph Massad in terms of that the Western human rights agenda is a Western agenda that it represents Western values and it isn't and that you know international or global LGBT rights activists are doing a disservice. Now, how do we engage that critique in a meaningful way while also actually responding to you know, the kind of violence we're talking about here, you know, the, the, you know, truly barbaric violence in these times? It's a very tough question. I mean, one of the things that uh, I had run a panel on um, on gay rights in, in the Middle East at the Out Games. Um, so one of the th subjects that came up, and I can't remember now who brought it up, was that the very definition of how somebody claims asylum is very much based on uh, Joseph Massad's definition of an international gay, uh, for whatever uh, you want of that definition. But a, a very Western sense of being gay, which doesn't take into consideration that somebody might be married, um, might have a boyfriend on the side and be persecuted for that, and it doesn't take in, in those other definitions. Um, I think that looking at other models of from the Middle East, you can have Lebanon is a very particular kind of example. Um, you can have gay rights movements that respect, for want of a better word, local culture, and you can have Western help, but leave the actual work that needs to be done with the local group. Um, Palestine, and I'm not sure if I'm even had, had brought this up, but an interesting thing is Palestine has sort of two sides. So there's Israeli Palestinians and there's Palestinian Palestinians, and I've been in um, done quite a bit of stuff in, in both. But there is also this notion that someone doesn't have to declare him or herself gay or lesbian, and it's sort of understood. And within the context of the culture, there, you know, we in the West think we need to have our rainbow flags, we need to declare everything that we are, we need to let our mother know that, you know, we are shipping our boyfriend and this is what we are doing and, you know, everyone has to know that and then you get a discount at Macy's because of it. But this doesn't work in most of the Middle East. So, one of the things that I, if, if I'm understanding some of the Palestinian activists, is that there is this notion that there's going to be somebody in the family that doesn't marry, that has a special friend. And that's not exactly explaining that that's a gay person or a lesbian, but it's understood enough in the culture and it doesn't push too much. And you know, maybe that's something that we need to understand as Westerners, that our model doesn't work in, in every part of the world. I mean, I'm struck in listening and thinking about this. You know, there's a historian at Philadelphia University, Phil T. Meyer, whose research includes yeah, um, you know, studying U.S. flight attendants on the Pan Am Middle East routes between, you know, from the end of World War II to the mid '70s, looking particularly at Beirut and Tehran, and looking at the vibrant gay male world in those two cities before the Lebanese Civil War and before the Iranian Revolution, and so I mean, it helps complicate, you know, U.S. ideas about the Middle East. In fact, even my word before choice of the word before barbaric, which I think is a fair word to apply to, you know, injecting. You know, glue into an anus, mm -hmm. and the kind of you know setting you know drag queens on fire. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's also a much more complicated you know, set of gender and sexual histories going on throughout the Middle East, and with great regional variants mm -hmm. than Western ideas about this kind of you know the image of that of the two Iranians who were hanged uh, a few years ago, or the kind of reporting that's come out. So that reinforces in many ways Western stereotypes of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. How do you think you know? as we move forward as a global LGBT movement, how, how do you think we can do some of the kind of work that you're talking about, bringing this kind of awareness of you know, what you know, the Macy's discount won't work, you know, the rainbow flag won't necessarily work? Well, you know, I think that one of the things that, that I emphasize with a lot of groups and a lot of people when I do talks is that, you know, we in the West like to really label things. You know, everything has to be labeled, everything has to be pigeonholed, everything has to... And then in parts of the Middle East, um, you know, even the streets have no name sometimes, but people seem to figure out where they're going. To a Westerner, this makes absolutely no sense, um, that you don't have a name for something, and yet everybody knows where it is and figures it all out. Um, and that there's this sort of nebulous 
characteristic that would never be tolerated in, in the West, and yet somehow it all works out. And I think an understanding that sometimes with sexuality, people don't necessarily define themselves um, in the way that we would, but yet they would fall along the LGBTQ spectrum. Um, so I think a respect for that as the gay world gets bigger, I suppose. Um, the support that, that it's funny that you mentioned Beirut as an example, is that uh, as I was there uh, actually about a year ago for quite an extended time, and I was going to be interviewing an artist who's, we would define him as openly gay, but then he didn't want to be defined as openly gay. Um, and he didn't want this to be what defines him. But for a Western gay publication, that's the reason, that's the whole reason to interview him. So there's this, even to try to interview somebody who's comfortable with his sexuality, still doesn't want to be defined in, in a Western way. Um, the, the other thing to think about is that, and coming out of years ago having done HIV work here in the US, we have this uh, MSM, Men Who Have Sex With Men, so men who aren't necessarily defined as gay. Uh, there's that awful term that's sometimes used on the down low. Um, and sometimes people try to explain uh, Middle Eastern behavior along those lines. And yet, sexuality can be more fluid and not defined. And I think for us in the West, that's the, sort of an affront to our own definitions. So having a more fluidity of definitions as we go into parts of the Middle East and do this work. I mean, that reminds me, I was thinking, you know, there is a film that recently came out, I'm blanking on the documentary by, uh, about the global LGBT rights movement that, that was shown here at the K School last spring. Is it John? Uh, uh, John Stegner. Stegner. Stegner, yeah. And I could be struck by, you know, there was a moment in the film, it's not about the Middle East, but about Iraq, but about, you know, a transgender Filipino who, you know, entered, you know, tried to describe you know, herself in, you know, and you entered different terms into Google and found, you know, Western language about transgender. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, the film made the point about the sort of liberatory effects of technology. Here's yeah. somebody you know, in the Philippines Googling terms until they find a label that fits mm -hmm. themselves. And yet, what, if you, you know, that knowing that, you know, Southeast Asia has all sorts of complex yeah. histories of, you know, third gender, of transgender, you know, not necessarily using the term, but that sort of the kind of, you know, coming up with a Western label, mm -hmm. you know, to identify oneself as opposed to actually looking to other local knowledges, local ideas about how we you know, make sense of you know, such things. I was struck in particular by, in fact, how you know, in rereading your, your work about the importance of technology and sort of how you know, it's you know, both liberatory and dangerous, you know, that we have you know, the importance of Facebook to yeah. your research, the importance of you know, getting to Google. I did, you know, and, you know, Man Jam yeah, is a social... Man Jam was very, very important, actually. It's a website that you know, even I didn't know about. Um, um, <laughs> that it's uh, you know the importance of blogging, yeah. um, you know you know social the kinds of ways that various social network sites allow gay men to meet each other, but that the videos that were used to promote parties were also used by anti-gay yeah. death squads, yeah. and that the, there's technology is not neither simply liberatory nor well. I think it you know it, it shows. Um, it shows a couple different things. It does show that I think the Western model of being gay are, are, tech, are spreading into the Middle East, are spreading into areas you wouldn't necessarily expect that they would. Um, whether it's through Manjam, whether it's through Facebook, whether it's through, I, I mean, for instance, the young man who took me around, he loved to uh, hear TV shows. And he wanted you know, me to, if I came back to Baghdad, to bring him shows from Hear TV. And I was surprised that he'd even heard of Hear TV. Um, so it just shows the influence of the internet. The Manjam is a site that, that is used for cruising. I used it to actually um, find men that I would be able to interview um, once I was in Baghdad and to do background work. Um, the bad side of that is that the, is the, the militias also did the cruising on Manjam and on other sites. Um, and then would have dates where they would, uh, and the people never heard from again. 
um, and also technology in particular. I don't think we do this that much here in the U.S., but on videotapes that would be made of people, and then those videotapes would be sent, I guess, via text um, around to phones throughout Iraq to identify people, um, and also to spread this, this, this hatred of gay people um, via phones. It's a technology that I, maybe if I talk to a 12-year-old, maybe they do this, I don't know. But sending, um, sending videos um, to each other on their phones. So it had this good side and it had this bad side. It connected the world, but it also made the world more dangerous in certain ways. Thanks. Uh, one of the things that sort of struck me, you know, is how much of what you're talking about are you know, public spaces, mm -hmm. you know, and to what you know your project set out to, in particular, you know, examine the experiences of of gay men and of transgender mm -hmm. uh, Iraqis, you know, specifically you know, male to female. Mm -hmm. Um, or using you know, their term, she may. Um, to what extent, even whether firsthand or secondhand, did you pick up new you know, stories about lesbians, about you know, sort of where they fit into this picture? You know, unfortunately, um, I didn't get to do much work with lesbians in Iraq. Um, Iraqi LGBT had mentioned that there was a house that had two lesbians in it. Um, for a variety of reasons, logistical reasons, I wasn't actually able to go to that house. Um, when I was in Kurdish Iraq, there's a woman I know who, if I were to base myself on stereotypes, I would assume that she's a lesbian, but I, I wouldn't even know how to frame that question to her. Um, and that's based on my own stereotypes of, of what uh, somebody who's stereotypically lesbian. Um, but what does that even mean? You know, but, uh, so the other thing also in the Middle East is that it's, it's a man's world. So as a man, I'm largely interacting with men, even though um, within educated Baghdad, it's very easy to actually interact with women. But in general, the night spaces, most of the spaces, and this is another part of this within the Middle East, because it is a man's world, and because most social spaces are all male, the gay spaces can exist within the mainstream spaces and almost be invisible because they are all male spaces. Mm -hmm. um, but I will acknowledge that I did not do as much as I would have liked to have done in terms of women's issues, in terms of lesbian issues, but it's not something I can really do as a man in the Middle East. That's something a woman needs to actually go in and do. So it's a criticism I will acknowledge, but there's a specific reason why I can't do that. It seems reasonable. And your comment, you know, I don't know how much time you spent in Iraqi Kurdistan, but was there any, you know, was the Kurdish region particularly distinct versus the rest of the country yeah. for LGBTs? Yeah. Um, probably about half and half, both of my trips were this three weeks in Baghdad, three weeks in Kurdistan. The trip before that, I can't remember my total amount of time, but it was half and half. Um, the irony is that Baghdad is the capital. Um, so capitals are supposed to be more sophisticated, more cosmopolitan, more international, more liberal. Um, Kurdistan, in general, for want of a better word, is a more tribal society. Um, we know actually that there are, there are honor killings of women, for example, within Kurdistan. Um, so it's uh, Iraqi Arabs consider Kurdish, the Kurdish region to be somewhat backwards as a general rule. Um, the irony is that the war has sort of changed this equation because it is so dangerous within um, Iraqi Arab, the, the, the Arab portion of Iraq. Are people familiar with the division within Iraq? Um, that Kurdistan, because it's safer, because a lot of international companies can set up there, um, because commercially speaking, it's also become vastly developed since 1991. Um, lots of glittering shopping malls and all kinds of development that have happened there. Still, it retains its tribal culture, more so in Erbil, which is the political capital, versus Sulaymaniyah, which is the cultural capital. Um, you did have gay men from Baghdad that I met, at least the first time that I was in Iraq, who had tried to move to Kurdish Iraq. There are restrictions, however, on single males uh, because, of the, because of trying to prevent insurgents from using Kurdistan as a base, where unmarried Arab men cannot settle in parts of Kurdistan. Um, so that 
prevented more gay men from using Kurdistan as, as a way to, uh, to get out. But what one man had explained to me when I interviewed him was that, um, okay, if, he, if his neighbors knew that he was gay, they would look at him very strangely. His mother might be upset that he was gay. People that he worked with might be upset. But he said, but no one, no one will kill me because I'm gay. And that, he said, is the difference between living in Kurdistan as a Kurdish gay man versus living in, um, in the, the, the Arab portion of Iraq. Um, and the, the thing is, though, within Baghdad, because it is the capital, um, it, it has revived some of this gay nightlife. Is still the capital. Mm -hmm. So, right. I have two more questions, and I'm going to open it up for the audience. Uh, one of which, you know, you, you've shown us the slide of the graffiti at the U.S. military base, where U.S. soldiers presumably had mm -hmm. you know, written the yeah. fat graffiti. Yeah. But one of the things that, by and large, the U.S. doesn't, you know, in thinking about the presence in post-invasion Iraq, is that it's not only U.S. military personnel. Yeah but also you know, an extensive U.S. civilian apparatus, whether the State Department or other agencies, extensive NGO presence, as well as you know, many people coming from other countries that do not have a you know, military ban. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about that presence of... Yeah. I touch on it in the article, and it's something that I have wanted to write about for the longest time, and every editor um, looks at me like this, but particularly with the mainstream, they look at me like I'm not. But uh, there is an enormous gay presence Within the non, within the non, the non-military presence within Iraq, and the, the Western presence has a very gay flavor. Um, there are many reasons for this. If you are to be sent to a war zone, typically you're not married and you don't have family, and that's why you get sent to a war zone, or why you choose to go to a war zone. And within that category, you will find a lot of gays and lesbians. Um, so across, and I can't do the work that I do if, it, if, I, if I'm not in touch with gay State Department people, gay NGO workers, uh, gay members of the UN, almost all of whom will never be mentioned by name in an article. Um, but it's quite fascinating, this gay network that exists within the war zones, outside of the military, which is completely unacknowledged um, by so many people looking at military, at, at the war zones. Um, within that, and I, I do mention a contact that I had at the embassy, he was no longer at the embassy, um, and he was fine to be identified as an, as a, as an employee of the, of the embassy. He would keep in touch with me and explain things that were going on, let me know things that were coming up in the course of his work, random contacts that, that he would get where gay men would find his email and, and email him that they needed help. Um, I believe that these people who are there, who are, they want to do more along the lines of this work, but they're within a particular structure that doesn't fully allow them to, or at least allows them, they can be wonderful contacts both for NGOs working on this um, and for journalists like myself who are going to explore this. Uh, will they want to be identified by name? That's another, you know, that's another story. But, but this, is a, this is something that exists within the war zones that so many people tell me this is just not true, it can't be true. But you know, even gay contractors, gay black, what is it, black XE, what is it originally? Blackwater. Yeah, Blackwater. Gay Blackwater employees. I mean, these are things that people don't think are possible, but these are very clearly possible. Um, and they boggle the mind of so many people. And the last thing I'm thinking about you know, is how, the funny thing I'm thinking about, but to sort of before turning it over to the, opening up to the floor, thinking about, of course, that the Middle East is back on the front pages or the digital equivalent uh, right now, not for Iraq, but because of the Egyptian and Tunisian uh, revolutions, the Libyan civil war that's erupted, the ongoing protests you know, from Syria to Yemen, Bahrain, and elsewhere. And one of the things, I wish I had a specific site, but hearing a, you know, at least one or two comments about you know, there's clearly a fear in mainstream Western discourse about the rise of Islamists in any of these countries, and that, in fact, that conceivably things could get worse for LGBTs, yet that seems to be buying into very old narrative and tropes about human rights and about sexuality and gender in the Middle East. So I'm wondering, you know, just if, you know, how you've been watching the last couple months unfold with a queer eye and what we should be thinking about. 
I wanted to just add one more thing to the previous oh, comment. Absolutely. The, the gays who are working in the NGOs, the gay Westerners, are also interacting with those the gay locals, and it's creating this very interesting mix um, and, and how people access Western information. So I wanted to just add that. Um, what I would add on this, on this digital thing and, and uh, things that are going on in Egypt, things that are going on in Libya, um, you know, what does this mean for Iraq? It's not covered a lot, but there are a lot of protests going on right now in Iraq against um, Maliki's government. Um, this isn't getting as much attention as maybe it should, um, considering what's going on in, in Libya, considering what's going on in Iran. These are much bigger stories right now. Um, but you have these protests where lawyers take over the street. You have these protests where people are upset about what's going on. Um, my personal belief is that you know, the, the U.S. invasion has been bad for Iraq, that's clear. But when we pull out of Iraq, um, and, and again, you know, Muqtada al-Sadr is gaining more power as our own power within Iraq wanes, um, it will be worse for gays, it will be worse for women, it will be worse for minority groups within Iraq. So I think that you're not going to see the end of it, you're going to see that it, we're not covering a lot right now, um, and we will see more of it. The other thing that I would point out, because um, I figured, you know, what, what are some of the other things that I don't know about that are going on? And so I asked a couple Iraqi friends what had been going on. Uh, I touch on this in the article that there are thousands of gay Iraqis who fled to Syria, for example. Um, the estimate that I got from the population was 9,000 gay Iraqis, half of them who fled with their families and half of them who came on their own. Um, out of a million Iraqi refugees that are living in Syria that are hardly covered, um, and the Americans don't even know a million Iraqis are living in, as refugees in Syria. And that the unrest that is going on now in Syria will be very difficult, will mean that Syria will be a very difficult safety valve for Iraqis who can't get to the West, gay Iraqis who cannot get to the West, um, who have no hope of ever getting asylum in the West, but can cross the border into Syria and at least use that as a safety valve. Um, and with what's going on in Syria, that will stop. And if it gets worse in Iraq and they can't go to Syria, which is the easiest way for them to escape, then, then what do they do? So these are things that have to be monitored, things that we in the West have to keep an eye on. You know, whether it is that we watch Twitter account because it's not being covered, and it's very difficult for a gay publication. Uh, you know, I do this work uh, as a piggyback to mainstream work because there's gay publications can't afford this. So it is the Twitter accounts. It is monitoring individual um, things that, that may give us more information. So I don't see it as necessarily going to be better in Iraq. The problem is when we pull out, um, we won't be paying much attention. And the bloodiest, the bloodiest parts of colonial, for want of a better word, domination, are always when the colonial power leaves. So after the British left India, the most bloody period was after that. Um, and I believe that as bloody as we've seen it in Iraq, it will get even worse once we pull out. So that's not really leaving on a very hopeful no, um, but I think that people should monitor the situation. They should perhaps be just, this is another thing that, because I'm sort of angry at the end of doing an article that people go shopping, they go, they think about Iraqis. Open up your home or find out, you know, contact the List Project. Um, contact um, Human Rights Watch, you know, um, which did fantastic work in getting refugees here. What are the things that you can do if you can't change the situation in Iraq? What are the things you can do to host someone for a year? What are the things you can do to help someone come to the U.S.? Um, so those are, uh, did I overstep the question? I don't know. I think that's appropriate. So. Thank you. And Tim, do you want to jump in? Yeah, let me, let me uh, take the convener's privilege here. There are two, two questions emerged for me out of this, and they're two very different questions. One is this question of homophobic violence. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, and, and, and the sort of staging of it, or, or homophobic violence is part of war. 
Mm. Right? And so when you were talking about the, the sort of glue and the anus and the sort yeah. of the attacks on these folks, ostensibly either as a way to police the homosexual as a person or to police homosexual sex yeah. as an act or behavior that is outside of a certain kind of norm. It seems to me that that's one kind of violence that occurs, and that, that, that may occur within a kind of culture, regardless of whether or not it's part of a war zone, or it may be exacerbated or take on a new kind of dimension in a war zone. But I'm thinking about that in contrast or in connection to the kind of simulation of homosexual sex in some place like Abu Ghraib, the way that the, the humiliation of Iraqis, the humiliation of, of, of Muslims, the humiliation of, um, of the enemy at, by, virtue, by way of simulating a kind of homosexual mm -hmm. sex or doing violence that is, that is you know, say, masochistic, that is mm -hmm. eroticized, that is, um, at, at its core, homophobic. Yeah. Right? And so how you piece together, how you put, how you see those as an acts of violence, which are very much rooted in stigma against homosexuals and homosexual sex together. Is there any way that we can see a relationship between those kinds of things within the context of the war zone? Well, a couple things that I would comment. Um, one of the gentlemen that I interviewed and specifically commented about the yeah. anal gluing yeah. was that that in itself was a message that you do not, by plugging up the anus and then leaving this person dead, right. the body itself a message, um, the message is you, you, you do not, the anus is not something that you use for sex. Right. And so that was a right. message, a religious message. Right. Also, there's sometimes with that stonings, which again is a very biblical right. Right. Uh, right. scripture, for want of a better word, I'm using biblical uh, religious writings. Um, the Abu Ghraib thing is extremely complicated. I right. bring this subject up when I would talk, when I would do more talks with gay travels in the Muslim world, that. We in the West have said that the reason that this was done was because of Islamic homophobia, right. but it's British and American soldiers doing it, right. so it's yeah. Western homophobia right. that is being projected onto Islam. That is used to be attacked. Yeah, war. yeah, and it's used for humiliation. Right. It's used for. Um, it's my understanding that the, the, the biblical, I've actually never actually looked for where this comes from in the Bible, but it's something that when I was young we were told, is that the, 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 the biblical prohibition against anal sex has to do with that there was a tribe that when they conquered, they would rape all the men. And that that's what this had actually come from. This is why, so even in biblical times, male rape was used to stigmatize an entire group to demasculinize them, to, um, to really show that, that they have been conquered. Um, it is also interesting that the, many of the men that I interviewed in Iraq would also talk about how, in spite of the homophobia, in spite of the fact that they could be attacked as gay men, they were forced to perform oral sex, for example, at checkpoints. So again, it's the men who are at checkpoints would not necessarily be able to do this to women, but they could do this to men because they're all around men. But it is also, as anyone will tell you about the definition of rape, it has nothing to do with sex. It's all about power. And so this is another component of power. It's male on male demonstration of power. Um, we have this actually within our own troops doing it to each other, yeah. but it's not discussed as much. Um, it, it's very complicated, but you know, I, I immediately say to people that the Abu Ghraib has nothing to do with Islamic homophobia, it has to do with Western homophobia. Because the most humiliating thing, you, you can say all you want about gay rights, you can give us marriage, but the most humiliating thing at the end of the day is that somebody's a homo. And so is to be a faggot. And so that is showing the power that, that, that we have over something that, that, that we've captured. And then my other question is much, uh, a much more straightforward one. Uh, you know, how do you see your role as a journalist participating in the Human Rights Project? How do you, do you see yourself as merely kind of representational, or do you see yourself as someone who's attempting to kind of inform a larger kind of activist project around human rights? Well, you know, I always clarify that I am a journalist. Um, so my view is 
that I go to places to cover things. And I will talk to someone who's murdered someone. I will talk to someone who's been the victim of, of, of an attack. Um, I try to be objective in a sense. I also think that if I didn't have a certain level of objectivity, I have a certain understanding. They know that they can bring me to places and I will understand those places. That's not necessarily activism. It's just something that I think makes, gives me the ability to do this kind of work that maybe a mainstream journalist, they would never have brought a mainstream male journalist to the Shisha Cafe. Maybe they would eventually, but they brought me there because I was a gay man who could pass as an Arab Christian, or a Lebanese, as, as they say. Um, in the course of doing work like this, what, what I find is you can have lots and lots of debates about things, and people will have cocktail parties, and they'll talk about, well, Uganda is really terrible, and Iraq is really terrible, and, and then the conversation will switch to, you know, Lady Gaga. You know, so, it's people really. Who's also very terrible. Well, the thing is, you know, actually, I used to think that, um, <laughs> that, that what's her name? Yeah, what's her name? Then I realized that she actually went to Iraq herself. I know, I'm sure. Uh, the one from the D list. Who's the D list? Heather Gurley. Heather Gurley. She went to Iraq. Yeah. So I have a lot of, you know, bring her up in a cocktail conference. She, she went there. Um, but I think that all Americans, this isn't just gay Americans, all Americans have this terrible disconnect with what we've done to a country. Um, you know, like I said, a million refugees in Syria. How many tens of thousands of people killed? S something like 3 million, 2.5 million, I think, displaced within the country. Half a million in Jordan. Um, I mean, imagine that's the population of Los Angeles suddenly having to live in Idaho, as, as, as an example. And, and how much of an impact that, that would have on our own. I mean, we're, or percentage-wise, because it's like 20% of the population, imagine, uh, what would be 300 million? Mm -hmm. Imagine 60 million Americans displaced, and you see that, what kind of an impact that would have. So gay Americans can be very disconnected, but I think Americans in general. Yeah. And that's one of the things that sort of angers me uh, in doing this work. Does that answer yeah, that? Yeah. So, did others have? Do you want me to pick them or do you pick them? Go ahead. Okay. So, Thank you for coming. Uh -huh. um, so most of this recent violence seems to have taken off after I told us the Sami issued a thought for mm -hmm. calling for the murder of gays in the most famous ways. Mm -hmm. And then he later retracted that same mm -hmm. thought. Form. From your, but the Western media didn't really cover why he had reversed his decision. I mean, from your conversations with diplomats on the ground, did you have a sense that they might have contributed to that at all? Or was there a backlash from human rights organizations in Iraq that might have? You know, that, that's a very good question and one to which I don't know the answer. And I will try to email. I, I just, the, the yeah. platform, it was a very tiny, Yeah. I mean, basically, like most, I as well as like most moms, he runs a sort of agony out of Christian answer on yeah. this section on his website. Most of which was filled in by junior emails. And this fatwa, which was technically a fatwa, was an answer to a question which we done about the socials. Mm -hmm. It was it was a very obscure part of his website, and I genuinely don't believe once around he's ever saw it, where it was seriously connected to violence at all. It was mm -hmm. publicized by Iraqi LGBT and activists in London. Um, he took it off his website because he was embarrassed by it and probably it didn't reflect the Ayatollah's own opinions, but frankly, it got far more publicity from the activists in London who were attacking it than it would ever have had from anyone fighting their in Iraq. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the gay Iraqis I spoke to who knew about it, when I asked them if they heard about it, they said, well, I heard about it from the publicity mm -hmm. not from actually seeing it. Should you say who you are? Mm -hmm. you no, say I, I'm Scott Long. <laughs> yeah, formerly of Human Rights Watch, so. And he was really, really helpful. So hopefully that answers, yeah, answers that. You had a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask another really dumb question, but you know. There are no dumb questions, so. so. So why don't people who are working for the State Department or NGOs want to identify themselves as gay? I can think of a number of reasons, but I don't know. Well, the thing about State Department people is they're never supposed to identify themselves in public to the media. 
Um, well, I mean, we. This is sort of knowing how the media works and knowing how the State Department works. I can get a lot of information from the State Department, but I'm never allowed to tell you who told me that. So um, for them to then be openly gay in an article is, is another thing. Uh, my friend who worked at the embassy was taking a lot of risks in doing what he did. Uh, but it is people like that that are very necessary. Um, and you see in lots of cases um, where there are human rights issues, and there's always somebody at the embassy who's, who's giving more information and who's helping. And people have an idea, but, but even they don't want to stop it. Sort of related to that, but as an aside, um, one of the things you find as a journalist, and, and I'm more of a parachute journalist, I'm not based in, in, in Baghdad, parachute journalist, meaning I kind of drop in and then stay for a couple weeks and then I leave. You would be amazed at the things that people working in the embassy will tell you because they're going out of their mind, they're crazy. They're, they're starting to go crazy, they're going out of their mind, no one's listening to them. They're surrounded by people exactly like themselves who are sort of scared. Um, and there's nothing that can be done. And, you know, I say it's like a Rutger Kipling novel. It's like really great people, like a great doctor who's in the middle of a terrible structure. And there's nothing you can really do about it. Um, and we also are sort of shoulders that State Department, it sounds crazy, but you, you know, it, it, it's true. We can sometimes be shoulders that State Department people cry on. Um, that also means you can't lose the notion that you are a journalist and you are there to find out information from them and even have that sort of antagonism. Um, but I think that State Department people do want to provide more information. Um, they also need to balance what they tell journalists with the overall goal that the U.S. has or the overall image that the U.S. would like to project. Um, NGO people, they really learn a lot. They know a lot because they're not always sort of behind walls. Problem with State Department people in Baghdad especially, you know, uh, there was somebody that I met who, he was a gay man who headed uh, a division of security. So I think a lot of information. And then at the end of it, you know, his, he was supposed to design how people from the embassy got out of the embassy into the red zone, for want of a better word. And he'd never been up beyond the walls of the embassy. So how this person can be in charge of designing security for a city that he's never seen, it's sort of beyond me. So it, it's, it's really crazy, actually. It really, it's, it, it kind of boggles the mind. But State Department people cannot be, even in a place like the part-time in Buenos Aires, I've just come back, I write the film of Buenos Aires book. The State Department gives me, tells me things that they want American tourists to know but I cannot identify them by name for the advice that they've given me. It's, and that's something that is so benign that they still can't be identified. So is that also the case for NGO people? You know, NGO people, it really depends. There are, the thing about the gay rights issues and, and working on the gay killings was that some of the NGOs did not want it to be known that they were working on um, the killings of gay men because it could stop funding coming in for other work that they were doing. It could stop people from um, from helping them to do other work. It, it could stop the women's rights work that they were doing if it was known that they were working on, on gay rights issues. So it's, it, it's a, this is a very delicate situation, particularly in, in a place like Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. Sure. The first one is on the same state uh -huh. discussion. Did you get the impression from your friend or other The, within the State Department, as part of the, the killings of gay men in Iraq are discussed in the overall human rights um, report that the State Department puts out on Iraq. Um, so they were working on it. It was part of the agenda. And the work that they did that they wanted to have discussed was published. You can download it from the State Department's website. 
Um, so yes, it was part of the State Department's agenda. My impression was that uh, you had people who wanted to work more and couldn't, or again, had to discuss it in the context of other issues, um, and also would want to discuss it more, but Iraqi homophobia got in the way, and it, and it would overtake discussions um, of other issues that they wanted to talk about. Now, the, the notion of were locals organizing, yes. Um, the man who, the young man who took me around, he had wanted to form his own group. Um, he sort of would help when he'd go to parties because he was a young man who liked to go to parties. When he would find that, that uh, for instance, he gave this example of um, a young man with long hair who came to one of the parties, and he, he and his friends hid this man until it was safe for him to go home. I think he, he was a Syrian or something, I can't remember the whole story. So if he had wanted to do more work and more organizing, he was also interacting not just with me, but there was a journalist, he couldn't remember actually who it was, but somebody based out of San Francisco who had also contacted him. Um, it is a small community, so generally many people know each other, but yet it also surprised me how many people did not know um, the various groups and how they were disconnected in many ways. The other point in a place like Baghdad is because it was so dangerous, but you find this not just with gay people but with young people. I, I, I'm friends with a lot of people from the Iraqi National Symphony Orchestra, and there's a lot of young people on it, and it's too dangerous for them to go out. So they talk to each other on Skype, they practice with Skype, they, um, they interact so that the, the internet has not just been helpful for them in interacting with the West, but also for organizing within Baghdad because it's just too, it's just too dangerous. So the very methods they use to communicate with the West, they use to communicate with somebody who's just two blocks away because they, they can't go there. Um, but these groups, my impression, uh, this particular gentleman has now left the country, so he's not there anymore. Many people who are good and want to organize, uh, it makes more sense for them to leave for themselves, ultimately. And that's one of the big problems. To what, you know, sort of follow up on the question about the State Department, to what degree has there been a change in the State Department you know, going from the Bush to Obama, Obama administration? How much is sort of, are we just talking about permanent you know, sort of career U.S. State Department personnel who, who are doing their thing regardless of whoever is currently in office? That's a good question. I mean, my last visit, the first visit was during Bush, the second visit was during Obama. Um, a few of the people that I interacted with were the same people. Mm -hmm. um, my impression is perhaps it was a little bit more open, um, but that's hard. I couldn't really comment properly on that okay. um, based on my own experience, and I don't want to kind of make up an answer on that. Um, I think we'd like to believe that human rights issues are more important in the Obama administration than they were in the Bush administration. Um, but I think overall we're not finding that necessarily as a general rule to be the case. Um, so. Any other questions that, that you want to go back? Hey, one, I apologize. This is the very beginning of talk, so you might have said this. Yeah. I, mean, I, really, I really appreciate how much you're saying there may be a different way of organizing desires and identities that we're not acknowledging if we're um, in the West and we're, we're looking to advance human rights and we're identifying them very specifically as gay and we're always expecting that identity to be in play yeah. in order for us to um, rally around folks. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering when you, at the end, when you were saying you really, um, you're concerned that when the U.S. leaves that things will become um, the more dire, the more violent, um, is that explicitly because the association with, with gay rights will be um, that it's a Western issue and the, in many ways it might be a move to, um, uh, you know, to, to a backlash because, of, of there, because there's a meeting of those issues as Western issues? And if so, do you see any efforts within um, international or local LGBT rights movement to, um, to acknowledge and recognize a broader way of thinking about um, the queerness that's happening there so that there isn't such an attachment 
to identity as a way of organizing and supporting um, folks who are you know, who have different ways of, of identifying themselves. A couple, there's a couple different points of uh, things I want to point out. Um, Many of the gay men that I met in Baghdad did say that they were happy about the invasion because they felt that it would be good for gay rights. That was an initial, um, an initial reaction, um, and that many of the gay men were happy to interact with U.S. soldiers, which actually became very problematic for um, one of the men that I interviewed because the fact that he had a photograph of himself with a U.S. soldier was one list, one of a list of, of problems and reasons why he was to be attacked. Um, the other thing that had come up, um, and I think people have heard the term puppy that was used actually to describe gay men. Um, when people would use this term puppy to, to degrade gay men, some of the same people who used that term had also explained that because the, the gays became more visible when the, after the Americans came, then it was a sort of a component of the American occupation and the westernizing that it did become equated with the US invasion in the eyes of many. It was part of the westernization process. Um, so it did get conflated. While the invasion created more violence, the invasion in the eyes of those who, were, uh, who wanted to justify their violence for that, it was bringing these Western immoral ways, which included homosexuals being more open, homosexuals going to, to clubs more openly. In particular, after the surge had worked, for want of a better word, um, and nightlife was revived. Um, whether this is part of a plan when the US leaves to think about this, I really don't think so. Um, but perhaps for groups who are interested, Western groups, American groups are interested in um, Iraq, it is something to continue to think about um, and to perhaps uh, put plans in place for when the U.S. does leave, what will happen um, in terms of gay rights work. I mean, the, the, the work that Human Rights Watch had done, I mean, that's, I think, a model for, for what could be done by other groups. Um, I don't know if, Scott, you want to go into more details about what you guys have done, but um, that takes money, that takes effort, that takes time, that's dangerous. It also means having um, good contacts on the ground who have to risk their own lives to make sure that this work gets done. And again, gays are one small part of, you're really going to see the backlash against women. You're really going to see it against women, um, unfortunately. Um, and the Christian population, which has also been quite decimated. Um, so yes, gays are one part of it, and they're, they're, but they're going to be a small part of the really terrible backlash, I think. I mean, hopefully I'm wrong in, in that prediction. Um, but, but that's what I mean. Does that kind of answer your question? Or, yeah. yeah so. And then you had a question also in the back? Yes. Um, I have lots of questions around the politics mm -hmm. between the little boy and the little boy. I'm going to ask one practical question. Um, I work for this organization in British Columbia called Labor Refugees Committee. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard of it, yeah. And we are this tiny little group of people who are helping. Basically, we started as a, a settlement service kind of volunteer mm -hmm. support group. And then we set up this blog a couple of years ago to kind of let, uh, let people know that we are there to help people settle down in Canada the refugees, queer refugees. Um, then all of a sudden we started getting like 10 to 15 emails every month from Iraq or Syria, people begging us to get them out mm -hmm. of where, wherever they are and like find a way to get them to Canada. Uh, we're constantly getting these emails from different people and we have absolutely no local connection to make that happen or even know what to say to these people. We don't know if replying to these emails is safe or not. Um, I was wondering if you have any names or contacts that we might be able to. We can talk more after on that. But um, my suggestion to you would be, is there somebody in Ottawa that you can contact about? Um, just offhand, I would 
do you have contact with anyone in Ottawa who could facilitate? Actually, yeah, Jason King, the immigration yeah. minister, came to us yeah. and asked us to be the kind of a middleman yeah. to facilitate the process. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the things that's, it's, the process of bringing someone over, I've actually I've taken care of, um, sort of joking but not joking with my mother will collect one for every war but um, but uh, I've taken care of an Afghan who, uh, who had asylum um, he wasn't gay but he was my transitor in Kandahar um, when I was doing gay work um, and then I've also I'm an anchor for an, an Iraqi refugee who's gay but that's not why he um, was ultimately given refugee status you need a network of people willing to host you need a network of people who will open their homes for like a year, but you also really need the context at the government level and within the NGO level to actually process the paperwork and also a holding place, a third country, to hold people while all of this is being done. Um, it, it's very complicated and people think, oh, well, can't we just open the door and have I also bring up the point that I grew up in a neighborhood that, that had a lot of Holocaust refugees. And I could never understand as a kid why more Americans didn't write letters, why more Americans didn't, you know, so that every war we have this, every, we just have this and we don't do anything about it. But you need to make these connections, but these are not, it's not simple paperwork, it's frustrating, it's expensive, and you need people to open up their homes at the, at the very end of it. I mean, I've talked about this with other travel writers because this comes up in the context of travel writing um, where we're touching on places like the Middle East. Uh, you know, oh, okay, go there as a gay person, blah, blah, blah. But there are real human rights issues that people aren't always addressing in the context of. Uh, but uh, we can talk more. It's, it's a very complicated question. It's really a matter of like connection. That's a, a wonderful idea and question. Great. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for being thank here you. and sharing this with us. I really appreciate it.